The story of Toronto begins over 4,000 years ago when our native ancestors inhabited this land. Prior to the influx of the first Europeans, during and after the American Revolution, and when the United Empire Loyalists fled the United States. In 1787, the British colonies purchased 250,808 acres for 2,000 gun flints, 24 brass kettles, 120 mirrors, 24 laced hats, a bale of flowered flannel, 96 gallons of rum, and an undisclosed amount of money from the Mississaugas of New Credit. This gave birth to what was then known as York. In 1834, it was renamed Toronto and became the capital of Ontario. Toronto's name originated from Tuck Toronto, a phrase used by native Mohawks that means where there are trees standing in the water that were located in the narrows where the rivers converged, a place where they could string their nets across the trees to catch fish. Toronto steadily grew during the 19th century, becoming one of the main destinations for new immigrants who helped build it into Canada's largest city and economic capital of the country. Here's what your daily downtown commute looked like if you lived in the east end of Toronto before 1920. Going through the neighborhoods, down across the Dawn River, and through the valley, and across the train trestle, making your way to downtown Toronto. It was the Prince Edward Viaduct, which is now known as the Bloor Street Bridge, which was completed in 1919, that connected our city and brought us into the Roaring Twenties. It was the brainchild of Roland Caldwell Harris, a visionary civil servant with a pension for large-scale engineering projects. He so loved Toronto that if he had the time, he would have counted each brick and kissed each one of them, according to the local newspaper of the Times. Connected now by an amalgamated transit system, the TTC, Toronto was optimistic and it built amusement parks and large scale projects like the Sunnyside Swimming Pool. And this brought people together throughout the whole surrounding regions. The streets of Toronto came to life as new street lights and traffic filled the streets. And Maple Leaf Stadium was the place you'd go to see a ball game. It was the St. Pat's that was the predecessor to the Toronto Maple Leafs. And after taking control on Valentine's Day in 1927, Con Smythe immediately changed that name to the Toronto Maple Leafs. As Prohibition came in to empty our glasses, our distillery district, one of the biggest suppliers of whiskey, gin, and hard liquor in the world, filled them right back up again. And Union Station was relocated to where it is right now on Front Street. Theaters, sound and motion picture houses adorned our streets and the Royal York Hotel started construction and became one of the tallest buildings in North America. It also hosted some of the greatest events in our city. It was October 29th, 1929, that it all came to a crashing halt when Toronto and every stock market in the world fell to its lowest point ever in history. Hockey, the fastest game on earth, was played out on homemade rinks 
all throughout Toronto and the surrounding areas. People played hockey everywhere. And then, on November 12, 1931, a new shrine to hockey, Maple Leaf Gardens, was finally built. The opening game featured the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Blackhawks. Although the original Toronto Zoo was built in 1888, where Riverdale Farm now sits. It started getting popular in the 1940s when they started bringing rare and ferocious animals to Toronto, attracting tourists throughout the region and putting Toronto on the map as a tourist attraction. On a rebound from the depression of the 1930s, Toronto positioned itself to be the financial capital of Canada where head offices of all the major companies began to locate. The 1950s will be forever known as the decade Toronto got its first subway, the first one in Canada, the Young Street Line on March 30th, 1954. And here's some rare footage of the first ride on the first subway that went from Union Station to Eglinton at the speed of 55 miles an hour. And on September 8, 1952, Toronto gets its first television station CBLT, a division of CBC, and begins broadcasting Hockey Night in Canada from Maple Leaf Gardens. And in 1954, Metropolitan Toronto is created to bring together the various boroughs into what is now a modern metropolis. And at the tender age of 16, Marilyn Bell becomes the first person to swim across Lake Ontario, 32 miles from Niagara to the CNE. Toronto's 401 last section is finally completed between Bayview and Highway 2 on October 24, 1956. And on August 8, 1958, the Gardner Expressway is completed, extending across our waterfront from Jameson Avenue on the west to the Don River on the east. And as new immigrants continue to arrive, Honest Ed Mervish, the son of Jewish immigrants, provided them with the best deals from Honest Ed's to get their start in their new home called Toronto. On October 1st, 1960, the O'Keefe Center opens its doors with a star-studded red carpet reception, complete with a marching band and a performance of Camelot, starring Richard Burton. And Young Street becomes famous for its gaudy signs. And on September 13th, 1965, the Toronto City Hall, or the new City Hall, opens its home for the Municipal Government of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And it's one of the city's most distinctive landmarks, designed by Finnish architect Vio Revel. City Hall is nicknamed the Eye of the Government because it represents a large eye in plain view. Revel died a year before the new City Hall was complete. Nathan Phillips Square is Toronto's fourth city hall. There's nothing quite like it in the world even today. The Art Gallery of Toronto is renamed Art Gallery of Ontario because it has more than 80,000 works. It has works from the Renaissance, the Baroque Errors, the Canadian Group of Seven, European, African and Modern Collections. And it also contains the famous Henry Moore sculptures. 
His Worship William Dennison, a former Cabbage Town alderman, presides as mayor of Toronto in 1969, an early environmentalist who personally planted over 40,000 trees in his life. In 1974, the Toronto Zoo opens as the largest zoo in Canada. It's divided into seven regions, Indomalaya, Africa, Asia, Americas, Tundra, Australia, and the Canadian Domain, with over 5,000 animals representing over 450 species. And on June 26, 1976, the CN Tower opens as the tallest freestanding structure in the world. A large radio communication platform to serve Toronto and the surrounding regions, the tower is a Toronto landmark and can be seen from as far away as New York. Roy Thompson Hall opens on September the 3rd, 1982. It's the home of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra and it also hosts many gala screenings from the International Film Festival. And you might have even seen it in blockbuster movies like The X-Men. The Metro Convention Center opens on October 2nd, 1984 and complements the CN Tower Roy Thompson Hall and over 40 million people have already visited. And on June 5th, 1989, the Rogers Center opens. Formerly known as Sky Dome because of its retractable roof, it got its first name from a public contest. It's designed to host outdoor and indoor events. Just perfect for Toronto's changing weather. As Toronto residents walked out their doors a few moments after the Jays won the World Series, they could hear the entire city cheering. It was incredible and it went on for hours. It was October 24, 1992. The Blue Jays beat the Atlanta Braves 4-2 and became the first team based outside the United States to win the World Series. And they did it again that following year on October 23, 93, being one of the first teams to win a back-to-back -back World Series. Toronto is celebrated around the world as one of the most multicultural cities anywhere on earth. With over 140 languages spoken here and one of the largest indigenous populations in Canada. Toronto has vibrant and dynamic neighborhoods that make up the mosaic of its culture. And we get to experience the rhythms of different cultures at our community festivals that are held throughout our city. We benefit from our diversity. It attracts talent from around the world and that's what makes our city what it is today. Currently in the midst of an ambitious redevelopment, Toronto's once stigmatized Regent Park is in the process of transforming into a mixed income residential community. Ultimately, the area's inclusive new urban geography has succeeded in removing the stigma once attached to the neighborhood. It's now halfway through a 20-year project. The revitalization of Regent Park has become a model throughout the world for urban redevelopment. Toronto's waterfront has come a long way since its days of being an industrial hub as it revitalizes about 2,000 acres of Toronto's waterfront. It's the biggest project of its kind in the entire world. Its goal is to create urban beauty 
and about making the city's quality of life and quality of space available to all its residents. Lush green playgrounds, wetlands, and a perfect view of the Toronto skyline. The revitalization of Toronto's waterfront continues to be one of our major accomplishments that will be enjoyed by generations to come. And now it's up to you. It's your turn to add your special talents, your work, your creativity to help us build Toronto together in the future. And I'd like to sum it up from a message from Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada. To those fleeing persecution, terror and war, Canadians will welcome you regardless of your faith. Diversity is our strength and so it is in Toronto. Happy Sesquicentennial.